I'm going to hit record. So we're going to start by sharing some of our major findings from each of our organizations uh, research studies in the last year on public interest journalism. For my organization, that means looking at the rise of nonprofit news. For, for Joe at PIMP, it's a bit different, but very similar in the type of journalism that we're looking at. So we'll kind of compare and contrast some of our major findings, and we encourage you to check out our full reports um, afterwards, or many of you might have already seen them. Then after that, we will open it up for a Q&A and some discussion, hear a bit about what each of you are thinking and studying. Uh, as we're going through the slides of our findings, we encourage you to please drop in the chat box your questions, your reactions, and we'll hope uh, to cover as many of those as possible in the second half of this session. Joe, I'll pass it to you. Cracking, thank you. I just had a, note, a WhatsApp from my boss. He's like, I can't find the link. Classic <laughs> Zoom fun. Um, so I'm just busy emailing it to him. That's great. Um, yeah, should we do? Um, I think we've we've introduced the, ourselves. We've done the chat. That's great. Um, should we do org bios? Quick sort of yeah, background on each that. org. I'm happy to go first, and I'll throw to you. So, uh, Public Interest News Foundation, only two years coming up, three years old in the UK. Um, and the interesting bit for uh, well, it's kind of geeky interesting, but um, for any lawyers out there, is that we were the first charity in the UK to be recognised as such with the sort of legal remit to promote oh. public interest news. Um, uh, and that was the first time that kind of journalism stuff had been recognized by the Charities Commission, which is the body that decides whether you get to claim all the kind of tax benefits of, of being a charity. Um, um, and in theory, we're there to provide grants and leadership development opportunities, as that bit says. Um, but we're also actually doing quite a lot of research. So stealing from INN, um, we thought we should publish this index of independent news publishing um, and we've done we're into the second uh, version um, and we're also doing a few other sort of researchy projects particularly based on the kind of provision side so there are other organizations out there that look at the consumers and the audiences um, our research angle is like both on the providers and publishers and then we're also looking a little bit about can we can we test social impact of any of this stuff but we'll talk a bit more about that later uh, Emily Excellent. And over in the US, INN, for those of you unfamiliar, I know we have a few members in the room. Hello, Ron, is an alliance of nonprofit news organizations that are committed to shared values that advance excellence in journalism, trust between the press and the public, and best practices for the nonprofit news field. We're up to having um, 400 member nonprofit news organizations. And of course, uh, nonprofit being a specific tax status in the US that requires additional transparency and also opens up organizations to uh, philanthropic funding from charities here. Uh, so INN is only open to nonprofit organizations. But the reason Joe and I kind of came together to compare our research is because um, we think that PIMP's research is one of the most comparable um, bodies of uh, media research in the UK, since they're also looking at these public interest news organizations, which we see as roughly similar to what our membership is working on. So that's a bit about our organizations. Um, let's get straight into our findings. So this isn't looking at everything we reported on, it's kind of just pulling in the major headlines where we could notice some interesting similarities, differences we wanted to share with you. Um, I'll start by explaining the INN index. So the index is an annual study that we conduct across our membership each year. And in this past year, we saw 93% of INN members completed the index. So, so this is a fairly comprehensive survey. And as I mentioned, this is only looking at nonprofit news organizations in the United States. Uh, but within that category, there's an interesting spectrum of local nonprofit news organizations, smaller shops serving local cities, counties, neighborhoods, or towns, all the way down to nonprofit national organizations, groups like uh, ProPublica or the Center for Investigative Reporting that are much larger um, organizations, you know, covering investigative reporting for the entire country. Um, 
Joe, I'll pass it to you to describe the PIMP index. So extremely jealous of that kind of 93% response rate they're getting over there. Um, and the difference is, of course, that PIMF isn't a membership body. So we don't have that sort of group of, of, of media providers that we can strong arm um, into providing responses. And actually, we don't know um, what the kind of the size of the universe of UK independent news publishers is. We're guessing something between 200 and 400. Uh, depending on whether you start including some of the, the very small sort of voluntary projects. Um, for, the, for the PIMF index, uh, we don't include voluntary projects, you know, you, or uh, it's, it's, it's more loose than that, actually. Um, we, we, we describe it as um, text-based, online or print, um, and you can have any geography or subject focus, but if you make more than two million quid a year, um, we're then not counting you as, a, as an independent mm -hmm. at that point. Um, and so, as I say, we, we came up with our own list of sort of 150 of these organizations. And I, I can talk a bit more about that list later. Um, and we sent them lots of emails uh, begging them to respond. <laughs> and some of them very kindly did so. Um, about 72 responses in total. Um, and a, a, one note is that what we find is that actually it is only completed by people who have a sort of registered organization. We've, we've never had, even though theoretically they could find it, um, we've never had a sort of bedroom blogger um, complete the survey. So it's, it's this interesting sort of self-identification thing going on for, for respondents. And the overall headlines that we will review today, uh, the, there's kind of two major headlines that came out of the INN index report. Um, and that is that the nonprofit news sector in the US is growing on two fronts. The first is that uh, new local news organizations are surging. So we've seen a wave of startups, particularly among these local smaller shops launching in the past several years. And as they're launching, they're creating new revenue models, new impact missions, uh, bringing in new audiences than before. On the other end of the spectrum, the uh, second sector of growth that we see is among our more established uh, nonprofit news organizations. Those are mostly our larger um, outlets covering a whole state or a region. And we're witnessing their total annual revenue and total audience sizes steadily increasing year over year. Um, Joe, I'll pass to you to review PIMP's major headlines. So I love those INN headlines and, and you, they get to a place where they can do that sort of storytelling headline because I think they've, they're onto their fifth year. Um, and in our second year, we, don't, we can't quite tell a story of development in any way. All we can do really so far is give the picture of the sector as we see it. Um, so the headlines are, these are super small businesses. Um, we'll come on to a second onto the revenue, but we're talking sort of one man bands or, or two woman bands or um, a few volunteers and someone gets paid occasionally bands of people. Um, one thing to note is that we include um, non profits, uh, for profits as well as non profits. Um, and we'll come on to a little bit about some of the differences um, in that. Um, in terms of subject matter, uh, uh, there's no, there's very little specialism. Um, I think only 6% of our sample focused on a single topic. So, so we're sort of environmental news specialists or uh, criminal justice news specialists. So what we're finding is that it, uh, that section in the UK just looks like people doing sort of general current news um, uh, across often a, a particular geographic community. Um, other headlines, people, People can probably guess these, you know, predominantly ad funded. That's very true in the for profits. I think for profits are 90% ad funded. Uh, there's a bit more other sources of revenue we'll talk about in a sec um, for non profits. Uh, and the other headline was that it, for, this was the, the second time we've run the index and we asked a question about impact. Um, and we were sort of really uh, excited and pleased by the responses that came back. This was clearly an impact driven sector. People were working in this space in order to benefit their communities. Um, or to fill a gap they felt was necessary in the kind of democratic space. And that came through really strongly, whether it was non-profit or for-profit. Uh, one thing that Joe and I cross compared is the revenue health of both of uh, the public interest sectors. And here in the United States, you can see about half of our member news organizations are operating on 
250000 uh, $250, or less each year. And about a quarter of local news outlets are running that on less than $100,000 a year. The median um, for the local news organization in the US, which is interesting to compare against Joe's uh, local figure on the right, is that the median local news outlet in the US uh, has about $250,000 per year, which is in stark contrast to what you see on Joe's chart. And so the important kind of thing here to note is that although uh, total revenue figures in the US we see as highly varied with our larger national and global organizations bringing $2 million or up per year, um, you, you can see it's kind of almost an even greater disparity um, in the UK. And with that, Joe, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, so we didn't break our sort of analysis of the, the revenue numbers down in the same way. Um, but that's partly because if we were if Pinth had done that exercise of the of the chart on the on the right, um, the vast majority, I think ninety percent, are going into that below two hundred and fifty k bracket. Um, the median revenue across all publishers in the survey was, I think, just thirty one thousand pounds. So that's about thirty one thousand uh, dollars at current exchange rates. Um, um, and one thing we did notice was interesting. Um, could you make us a cup of coffee, please? <laughs> um, oh, yeah, one for everybody. Um, was was this difference? There's this huge difference in the area you're focused on as a publisher and the revenue you're going to get. So where um, some of the UK publishers do uh, strike out with significant revenue, it's where they're doing they're, they're globally focused. Um, and I've just noticed that I think Open Democracy have just joined uh, this call, and they're a nice example of that. They're UK based, but and I think their coverage is largely UK centric, but they're also covering uh, worldwide issues. There's then a few that are purely on the UK and, and they're, they're still managing a, a sort of um, uh, relatively impressive turnover. And then the vast majority of these sort of very small local micro businesses. So let's break down what those revenue streams are uh, both in the US and the UK, we just covered kind of total revenue, but looking at where that revenue is coming from in the United States, something we see clearly is not only is total revenue affected by the geographic scope of the outlet, but the types of revenue that those outlets are seeing also varies by their geographic scope. And so you can see on the right-hand side, our uh, national and global outlets, uh, the majority of their revenue comes from philanthropic sources, mostly national foundations here in the United States. Uh, whereas less than, you know, a little over a quarter comes from individual giving or reader revenue. And just a tiny, tiny, you know, 10% comes from earned revenue, which um, I should take a moment and pause here that we call, we use earned revenue as an umbrella term to cover advertising, sponsorship, underwriting, pretty much any dollar received from a, a business. Um, Joe will kind of refer to this as just advertising as the umbrella term. And then same with individual giving. In this presentation, at least, we use individual giving and reader revenue as synonymous terms. Uh, so anyway, so that's national and global. You can see on the other side of the spectrum on the left, among our local news outlet members, they see less support from foundations, 40% from philanthropic sources, and they see um, better success with advertising with er those earned revenue dollars. Uh, over to Joe. Thanks, Emily. So, the, I mean, the big overall picture here is that just philanthropy occupies so much of a greater chunk of the revenue stream um, in the US across across the whole suite um, from, from local to national. Um, but that picture was obviously um, greater uh, at a national and global level. In um, in talking about this, Emily and I um, have gone back and forth a few times and um, Emily's sort of uh, generous point towards the UK was that perhaps because actually it's a, it's a more balanced basket of revenue. Um, so that that pie chart is fairly neatly divided. Um, um, but we can see that advertising is really the, the still the, the the serious chunk of funding there. Um, and if we think about the the previous slide, 
you know, your local, at the smallest level, your local publications in the US were oh, perfect. Thanks, Emily. Um, we're still that 40% of revenue is coming from foundations. And you can see right down in the sort of bottom left, if you can, um, if you can read that small, but trusts and foundations are, are maybe a third of those philanthropic grants in the UK. Um, so this is this, this, this massive kind of mismatch and um, that's something we're really interested in at PIMP and we're going to keep digging away at and, and see if we can shift that pie chart around a bit. Um, hopping back over to looking at the outlets based in the US, one thing our index also focused on is we talked about total revenue, we talked about revenue streams. We also looked at how each of those revenue streams is is growing or shrinking. Uh, and we can do this because we have some uh, four-year trend data from our index dating back to 2018. And what we noticed um, were some pretty you know, promising signs that we hope can act as proofs of concept uh, for outlets, both in the US, but also globally that public interest journalism um, is seeing a steady increase in funds you know, philanthropically, but also kind of most impressively within that individual giving stream, we saw 70% of the outlets that we studied over this four year time frame increased their um, dollars from individual giving during this time frame. And that, you know, goes through the COVID crisis years uh, and beyond through the election years, it kind of steadily keeps ticking up. Uh, most impressively is within that individual giving bucket, contributions from small dollar donations is on the fastest growth track here in the US. Nearly 80% of outlets in our cohort increase small dollar donor revenue during this time frame, And more than half of those outlets doubled or more than doubled um, revenue from small dollar donors. And so this, that kind of small dollar donor individual giving revenue stream is one that many publishers here in the US are, are hoping to build out more in the coming years because of this kind of promising sign. And, and that's where many US publishers are looking at folks in the UK and Europe for kind of um, what, what you're all doing with membership programs and things like that and seeing great success there. Over to you. Thanks, Emily. So, um... Yeah, that bit of on, on reader revenues is really interesting. Um, and at two years in, we don't quite have the, the data to be able to show um, whether that's growing, falling, how that's looking. But in some of the um, sort of more qualitative questions we asked, we asked people what they were sort of optimistic about. And we did hear from people that reader revenue was the thing they wanted to work on and, and, and wanted to push on. Um, this chart here is just is, is perhaps the closest reflection we came to to to, to Emily's point just now. I think it's a less rosy picture. I don't think revenues are, are sort of motoring forward in the UK. Um, you can see that pretty volatile, um, and that's partly a result of um, the very low median turnover in the first place. So if you're if your turnover is thirty grand and you secure you know one or two new advertisers, or you lose one or two new advertisers, it might be that your revenue is down twenty percent or up twenty percent. Um, one thing's interesting is when we split out between non-profit and for-profits, the for-profits are doing slightly better. Um, um, and, and that's true, you know, their overall revenue is typically two or three times the average non-profit, but, the, but they're also showing sort of this, this data is slightly more positive in terms of their revenue growth as well. Joe, you make an interesting point, which we haven't discussed around the volatility of earned revenue. And that's you know, something we saw in our data too, where that that was the revenue stream that saw the least amount of growth over the four year um, period. And since publishers in the UK are primarily funded by earned revenue, I, I can see how that's, our data is connected there. Um, okay, so another major headline, we just talked about revenue trends and kind of showing the established, uh, the growth among kind of the established sector of public interest journalism. Uh, another finding that we talk about in the US index is the surge in local news organizations launching. Um, well over half of new outlet launches since 2017 have been local news organizations. And this is just getting more and more pronounced year over year. In 2020, 57% of news outlet launches were local. One year later in 2021, 65% of new outlets uh, launching were local. And based on our early 
membership data, we are seeing this trend continue. So kind of the headline here is that there is growth in the number of outlets here in the US and that is largely driven by the growth of these smaller local outlets launching. A similar room for optimism in the UK. We don't know whether they're sort of local, national, global, um, but we do know that, that UK outlet growth is accelerating or, um, or certainly really motored in the 2010s. Um, we were having a little chat before the call about why that might be and um, uh, welcome some comments in the chat, but my guess is that's something around that was when sort of the digital media, I mean, it was well, Facebook was invented in 2005 or something, perhaps the 2010s are when it really comes to the crunch. Um, there's a lot more people feeling that a, they can um, start their own start their own thing, but there's also um, pressure from top down, lots of local newspapers being bought up by the big groups, losing staff and, and some of those staff go away and um, with their redundancy package go and set up um, a sort of local independent community newspaper. Um, but that's something we can delve into a bit more. I think positive sign is that two years in, uh, we've already seen seven new outlets um, uh, so far in the 2020s, um, we're going to keep monitoring that. And hopefully, that 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 number grows. Um, I'm also quite interested in uh, sort of the types of um, new outlets. Those are the little hunch I have is that sort of the ease and popularity of email newsletters. Um, some of those might well be things like the Manchester Mill uh, or North North Ants Journal or South Rugby News. There's quite a few of these sort of new local outlets because all you need to do is set up your Substack and you can just run away and, and go for it. Um, so yeah, we're going to be keeping an eye on, on that one. This was a nice similarity, um, as I mentioned before, the first time we'd asked about impact, um, and, and just very clear that, um, all these independent news publishers see themselves as, um, some kind of boost to civic engagement, um, you can have a read through the, the the actual categories we offered people on the left hand side, but they all really are could, could be could be included under that sort of sort of democratic engagement um, place, um, and and I think that's true in in the US as well, Emily. Yeah, exactly. So this was a finding that stood out to both Joe and I. This um, laser focus on civic engagement as an impact priority for public interest journalism, because so much of impact priorities that we've been discussing years back has kind of focused on things like uncovering corruption or um, shifting a narrative in a community, which is still very much an impact for many of our members covering state, national, or global news. But among our local, locally focused news organizations in particular, we are seeing that they have, an imp they have a, a focus on inspiring or enabling civic engagement, connecting people to civic life. And that, um, you know, that affects revenue strategy, that affects how these um, outlets are engaging with their audiences. And so it's, it's something to note that there is this rise in kind of a new model of, of journalism emerging. And we see how this is connected to and how these outlets are um, connecting with their audiences. Joe, do you want to describe this chart? So this was UK uh, data. Um, and interestingly, this is both nonprofits and for profits, um, and I think we did do the um, the split somewhere else. Um, but actually, for profits relied on volunteers or or, or made some use of volunteers um, uh, to a lesser extent. But it was still it was still surprisingly significant, um, which I think just speaks to the idea that you know we might have for profit um, um, publishers here, but they are they're clearly. Uh, sort of social mission driven uh, they're not here for the money and they're able to convince volunteers to come in and, and commit some hours of time to, to to helping those publishers produce good news yeah and this was something we saw among our u.s publishers as well we asked about this not in our most recent survey but in the year prior and found a, an eerily similar trend where about a third of the outlets we asked said that they uh, rely upon volunteers i think we said to a great extent and we reached out to those folks and said, tell us more, what are, what are you doing with these volunteers? And it's, it's, um, it's across the whole spectrum. It's volunteers delivering the free papers. It's volunteers helping to write or edit or uh, fundraise, you know, volunteer board members. Um, and this I think is very much connected to the growth we see in the US around 
small dollar donor engagement. Um, and I think the kind of bigger headline here is to notice this cultural shift among media in the US of now these news organizations are operating very much within the traditional nonprofit space of attracting volunteers to engage with your work and um, working on this kind of civic, the civic mission. Uh, so this is something that we're, we're watching fairly closely at INN and, and what that means for how we support these types of members and um, their revenue streams. Uh, more on audiences. So we ask a bit about uh, which platforms our members use to reach their audiences. And I think we ask about this in slightly different ways, but this is the most kind of compare, like the best comparison we could get. So we ask about, uh, we ask our survey respondents to rank the top platforms that reach their direct audiences and then also their third party audiences. A big part of INN members uh, strategy is giving away their coverage free of charge. There isn't 90% of our members don't have paywalls, so their coverage is extremely accessible and open to be republished. Um, so direct audiences are, you know, the vast majority are being reached on, on their website. Secondly, uh, over email newsletters, which kind of connects with Joe's point uh, before about these, you know, small and scrappy email newsletter shops emerging. And then thirdly, 8% uh, of our members said print is their primary platform of uh, connecting with their or reaching their readers. Uh, for the third party audiences, so these are um, the platforms that are carrying the coverage produced by our network. Print again emerges as the top contender with um, half of third party audiences from our network being reached over print uh, and you know slightly similar patterns with, with print and email there as well. So this is an interesting um, point of contrast, I think, is that this 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 um, thing about third party audiences in the US and how much that content is being reused and reaching uh, greater audiences, I guess, and thus having more of a public interest effect uh, would be my assumption. No, I hope that's true. Um, and we asked a little bit about this in, in the UK. Um, I think it was a question along the lines of do you work in uh, together or partnership with other news providers um and in the vast majority of cases it was it was no um where it did happen it was a bit of content sharing but but that sort of third party audience thing i just don't think it's happening to the same extent in the uk which is interesting but in terms of audiences more generally it's a very similar picture so the web absolutely far and away um where the traffic was uh, which i thought was interesting i thought it might be seeing more uh, over on email but actually in the uk email ranked below Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, um, people's Facebook presences was probably their next most important after their website. Uh, one with all the sort of critiques and complaints and issues that that, that, that brings. Um, mm. But other way, I think we're looking at um, kind of similar, quite quite similar audience makeup there. Mm. So we just reviewed some of the major headlines from our reports that um, where we could find some similar comparisons. We're next going to talk about a few challenges and opportunities that we noticed in our data. Um, the first that INN covers annually is around staff diversity. And something we noticed is that staff diversity, so this is looking at um, folks employed by the nonprofit news outlets that we study, staff diversity remains highly variable in the US. At the most basic level you can see on the left, about half of employees across the nonprofit news sector are white and about a third are people of color. And when you compare these demographic percentages at the most basic level, they do roughly represent where the US is according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. However, when we look at who is driving that staff diversity, um, we can see that a little over a third of the field, like 35% of our outlets accounts for 83% of all staff of color field wide. And so um, it's, it's largely our member outlets that are uh, primarily serving communities of color in the US that are staffing and hiring and um, giving leadership positions to, to people of color within those newsrooms. And so this is something that 
INN is very laser focused on and we have an emerging leaders program and other trainings for our members um, to address this challenge. And I'll just add, Joe, since I know you discussed gender, that interestingly, in the nonprofit news field in the US, we are um, very uh, uh, representative in terms of gender representation. It's about a 50-50 split, um, both for staff. And I actually think there's more women in, in leadership positions in nonprofit news in the US than men. So that's something that we haven't so much been, been focused on here because we see most of our work in the upcoming decade really around um, race and ethnicity, uh, diversity and inclusion. Joe, I'll pass to you. Oh, Joe might have froze. Yeah, apologies. I can hear you, but you oh, might okay, not be able to hear me. I can hear you now, Joe. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> all I'm seeing is a largely sort of black screen uh, and Zoom team not responding. So um, I might reboot this computer in a sec. But just to finish this slide, um, yeah, we don't see the sort of independent news sector in the UK reflecting the population. Um, so 29% uh, of people working in the field are women, 28% um, in, in, within leadership roles, um, and only 4% um, of people working in the, in the field are uh, of an ethnic minority and including white minorities um, and only two percent in leadership roles and, and the picture is about 20 percent of the population um, is is an ethnic majority including um, white minorities um, and just uh, an interesting note on the language because uh, Emily and I had an interesting conversation about that um, earlier the the phraseology we're using there is, is borrowed from the UK's Office of National Statistics um, and um, we don't use the phrase, for example, people of color in the UK or, or according to the National Office of National Statistics, we don't um, uh, because it doesn't include white minorities such as Gypsy Roma Traveler or other groups like that. Um, so there's the, there's the little point on the language. Um, but, but the biggest story is there, we've got quite a long way to go. And while there are some interesting national organizations working at kind of national level on, on diversification of staff in the media, particularly in things like the BBC, um, I think there's a little gap there between in the sort of in the smaller publisher world and there's an interesting challenge for us all there. Thanks, Joe. Um, another challenge that we noticed, and I think is the challenge that we end on before we pivot to uh, discussion and Q&A. So I'll just take actually a moment to pause here and say, uh, if you haven't already, if, if you have any questions or comments on any of this, please drop that into chat. And Joe and I will um, will spin on that for as much remaining time as we have. And we might also call on some of you in the audiences to say hello and explain a bit about what you're working on as well. But back to this final theme here that we notice, uh, a big challenge that we see in both actually the US and the UK is that uh, philanthropic support is mismatched to growth, the growth and news needs that we see across the sector. And so in this chart, you can see um, the blue columns represents the um, percentage of the field staff working in the type of news outlet. The orange represents the percentage of the field's foundation funding that this type of news receives. So you can see that although local news organizations employ over 20% of our sector's staff, local organizations are only seeing about 10% of the field's foundation support. In contrast, national and global organizations are employing a little over a half of our sector, yet bring in close to 70% of our field's foundation support. And what this means is that INN and many other organizations are working to get more funders and folks involved in creating new funds for journalism here in the US. So not just pulling on journalism specific philanthropic sources, but looking for other kind of philanthropies that could be connected to journalism uh, and also trying to redirect some of those funds from national and global entities to more local outlets. Um, and we don't have quite the same data breakdown, but it's a very similar story um, in the UK about um, this this is quite an interesting chart. It shows that sort of the type of journalism you're doing is going to attract a very different um, sort of suite of revenue sources. Uh, if you look at this, the third one, current news and events, that really is what our 
the the big majority of the sector is doing um that's typically where they are sort of very local or county based um as you can see the philanthropic grant funding for that level is also tiny at 16 percent uh, if you're doing sort of explan explanatory content and analysis so for example if you're economy.org or if you're each other.org.uk where you're take where you are taking a sort of specific um issue or sector and you're doing kind of explanatory content it looks like the foundations actually will pony up some money at that point um but when you're down at a sort of local and community level that's when it's much much harder to we think access funding but also people just don't they don't have the teams uh with the capacity to fill in the grant applications um and all that kind of stuff um so there's some so there's some work to be done there um we talked a little bit about reader revenues early on um and there are some positive signs looking at sort of investigative journalism in particular they are especially strong on on convincing readers to, to pony up some money um, and maybe that's because they're offering something that isn't accessible anywhere else um, but there might be there might be lessons to be learned from from that space joe your point around how local news organizations don't often have the resources to write grants is, is something that we see here in the us where um you know there's nothing malicious going on with the mismatch it's more of a structural issue around uh resources of these local news organizations and you know of course we're not expecting national uh philanthropies to maintain 400 different relationships with every single local outlet and so um we uh one solution that we have to this problem is one of INN's cornerstone programs that we call Newsmatch that some of you might be familiar with and it's uh essentially revolves around an end of year matching campaign where INN, along with a coalition of our partners, builds a pool of uh, match dollars from various foundations, companies, et cetera. And those match dollars are then available to many of our members uh, to use on their own year end fundraising. So our member news outlets can approach uh, local community foundations, local businesses, their you know, own readers and say, you know, hey, you should give us a gift and you will be matched by Newsmatch. And we've seen enormous success here in the US around this tactic of using national philanthropic funding to inspire and engage more local funding sources. You can see in this chart that um, as the pool of lighter purple uh, national Newsmatch funding dollars has increased year over year, we're seeing a steep increase in local matches secured year over year by our member newsrooms. And um, this model is something that Joe and I have talked quite a bit about to see if it would be replicable, replicable in other places. Yeah, we're, we're very keen, I think, to, to steal some kind of, 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 of newsmatch model uh, and at least give it a pilot attempt in the UK um, in the near future. We'd love to hear of similar projects anywhere else around the world if anyone knows of them uh, dump them in the chat because it's all very helpful for making the case to um to donors and um and potentially this might be a way of of actually accessing some public funding um in the uk in, in the in the maybe in the medium term mm -hmm. oh i forgot about this section okay one more one more section what's next <laughs> and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion uh what's next i alluded to this but we are very focused on diversity equity and inclusion and in our next index we'll be asking more questions to address um the inclusion part of that puzzle so not just looking at numbers of staff but also seeing kind of more qualitative uh things that are happening across each of our members and then another thing we're looking at is market analysis and so something we hear a lot from our member outlets is that it's somewhat helpful to see the data split by geographic scope, local, state, national, but it would be more helpful if um, members could understand uh, those figures broken up by the market sizes that they serve. And so uh, we are kind of undergoing a shift here where we're thinking through how we can provide benchmarking data to our members and the field based on uh, the size of the of the market that each news organization is serving or or aspiring to serve uh, another thing we're doing is starting to group our members into pods to better understand the unique models emerging in nonprofit news here in the us 
And finally, something that both Joe and I are thinking through, and you can probably get a sense of this in our early impact data, but we're both trying to crack this impact question and better understanding what are the main categories of impact that public interest journalism is working towards and how are folks best kind of articulating that impact with their audiences and funders and partners, things like that. And on our side of the pond, um, it's um, we really need to boost our sample size for the index going forward. So we've got a target of 100 um, publications filling in uh, the 2023 survey. And then we're going to be able to start um, uh, both telling some sort of stories over time, but also drawing more complex um, correlative analysis uh, between things within the survey. So. Um, for example, the survey in the last couple of years has shown that the greater the percentage of ethnic minority staff you have, um, that's that's correlated with a higher turnover. Uh, you know, is is there a causative relationship there? We don't know, but actually, if if we could get more, uh, if we get a bigger, much bigger sample size, we can start to sort of. Um, I'm not sure of the statistics, but our very clever statisticians can start to do some more clever stuff where they can start to try and make some more concrete causative claims. Um, so boosting our sample size. And if anyone's got thoughts on incentives, um, I'd love to hear that as well. If you've run surveys, how do you get people to fill these in, um, especially if they're not you know, your membership? Um, and we're also thinking about some questions on mental health provision or it's something that's come up a couple of times um, around fears of um particularly in some of the sort of smaller local newsrooms it's often left to one person to uh, deliver this local newsroom on their own um you know are do they have access to to support um uh it's we've been asked that a few times and we're thinking about some questions on on that kind of stuff beyond the index um we're gonna look at geographic mapping or we're hoping to do that um so as i said we had we don't have a nice list of all the providers that we can go to and, and ask them nicely to fill in the survey. So one of the things we have to do is 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 really nail that sort of um, UK directory almost. Um, and and we're inspired by the US News Deserts um, project and the mapping that um, Penny Abernathy has done at uh, UNC, I think it is in the US. Um, uh, and also there's a there's a nice example in Australia, the Public Interest Journalism Initiative um, produces a sort of Australian news map. Um, um, and I just think that sort of that, that graphic demonstration of where the gaps are, which areas of the country are strong, is just really interesting and, and quite compelling. And again, on the impact research. So we heard from providers that they are, they believe they're all, um, uh, they're in it for making, for boosting civic engagement. Um, well, can we show that that happens in practice? Are more people registering to vote? Are more people voting? Um, mm. Do people feel have more knowledge or trust? And we ran what we called the Impact Fund, where we funded a few publishers, a little bit of money to do an extra bit of election coverage um, earlier this year. And the results were kind of inconclusive. Like we couldn't show um, any increase in um, voter turnout or registration as a result of um, uh, the increased journalistic coverage, but we got hints of some of the sort of qualitative um, data, whereby a little bit of extra money led some of the publishers to run in-person events, and from those in-person events, they made better connections with politicians, which in turn meant the politicians would show up to other, and you could just see how that sort of, you can tell quite a compelling story about, about impact there, so a bit more research onto that, we'd love yeah. to, love to, um, I haven't talked about that further, but that's for another event. <laughs> <laughs> Round two. All right, that's about us. We would love to hear from folks in this room. Uh, what are you working on? Are you tracking public interest journalism? And so uh, why don't I do a pause and um, feel free to unmute, say hello and share a bit about what, what you're working through. Okay, I can start. Um, hi guys, um, I'm Otto from Netzwerk der Scherche uh, from Germany, and uh, we came up with the idea, <coughs> sorry, to um, make our own little survey on um, the nonprofit uh, sector in Europe. Um, that when 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 we started, we didn't know that the INN would be 
very much open to collaborate and to to share um, their their survey tools. So um, we came up with our own. That's why our data is not really comparable to the two uh, indexes we we saw earlier. Um, but I think the the trends are pretty much yeah not not the same, but um, um, looking at the growth of the sector, uh, we can say that, of course, in the last 10 years, there was a big boost of um, new uh, newly funded um, outlets. Um, interestingly, advertising in, in the European sphere was not as big as in the UK. That uh, I think was very interesting. Um, you can check out our report. Um, I will uh, send the link. It's called the New Sector Report. Um, I will put it in the chat and you can read it. It's in English, so everybody will understand it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, um, we just uh, finished uh, an application for an EU grant. And if we get it, uh, we will uh, hopefully start uh, making a much larger, much more in-depth um, survey with the help of Emily and hopefully Joe. And then, yeah. We'll have some more comparable data for for Europe. Thanks so much for joining, and we're excited to work with you and to expand um, the party of comparative data. Anyone else want to say hello and share what you're working on? Sure. Um, I'm Stuart Ricketts. We're in Mansfield, England. Um, I did put a little chat up just now. I, we like to think we're the only paper in Britain that focuses only on good news. Um, with some some considerable success, I have to say. Um, what I found interesting was particularly uh, the slides around the philanthropic approach that you've got put over in the States, Emily, and we've got a little bit of here as Joe was explaining. 43% um, of our income comes from you know, philanthropic uh, you know, donations, in particular, you know, but really under the guise of corporate social responsibility. You know, I've taken it upon myself to uh, go and pitch local, substantial local employers, remind them of their responsibilities to the local community, and by providing them with a uh, a package of promotional um, advertising, not editorial, I might add, promotional um, material, both online and in print, um, we've got the majority of our pages are now effectively sponsored. So our, our platform each month um, uh, currently, this month is 43%, but it will be a bit higher next month. So each time as we start the, the monthly cycle, we're in a slightly better position um, to pick up the additional revenue that comes from conventional uh, advertising. Um, so that approach has gone particularly well in the last uh, six or seven months. Um, as, as, a, as a small little publisher, we're starting to climb out of the um, issues of pandemic um, you know, we've, we've had all sorts of um, supportive funding, all sorts of different ways. Uh, all of it has to be repaid. Um, so um, we've, we've started to put that right uh, with some success in the last, particularly the last six months. Um, so that's something that's worked well for, for us. Um, and I have to say, as, as positive as we are around most of the social media platforms, um, the fact that we just concentrate on on good news is a is seen as a very very positive thing, um, mm -hmm. and the fact that we both myself and the editor uh, are very well known locally. We were both former. I was the former MD of a fairly big um, regional paper, uh, and Tim was the editor. Uh, so our reputation means that what we publish has got some credibility, and that's helped us uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, I like this Stuart. sort of CSR angle is quite interesting. I'm thinking we could ask a bit more about that next time. Sort of actually, you know, you can call it advertising or you can call it philanthropy. There's actually a bit of a both going on. They're sort of merging somewhere, aren't they? Um, yeah, interesting seeing a nod from Daryl. Um,
Um, yeah, I'll just let's just say something really. I, I'm I'm Daryl. I'm actually in Germany. I'm I'm based in in um, South London. I I run public interest journalism site in South London called Eight Five Three Dot London. I'm actually on holiday in Germany at the moment in a hotel bar in Bremen at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so we can hear the ch- chink of glasses and things behind me. That's what it is. Um, so yeah, so I mean I'm a one man band. Um, so I'm having to keep an eye on if things are happening in London while while on holiday. Um, it was seen to me. I, I, it was either doing this or going to the Lion Publishers thing in um, Austin, Texas, um, and then you know, I said that was just too expensive to do. But I mean, I've always looked at what Lion does, and it's like a different world because there is money available, there's help available. Whereas in Britain, it seems to me that I think the small publishers are too small because I mean, particularly in London, there's quite a few of us that are just one or two people bands, and the big publishers are too big. And I've just cut back, cut back. So, you know, we, you know where I am, the, I think the last surviving sort of, you know, local papers, you know, they are, they are mostly a part, a part of huge corporations that have just completely cut back. And there's now no meaningful coverage. Big companies are hoovering up the grants. They got loads of government funds in the pandemic, you know. So, so that that's the problem, I think. So for, for someone like me is is trying to raise that money to, to basically even stop being part-time and to move on further than that. So, yeah, but I just wanted to bring your observation. Do you, do you agree with me? I thought, does it, do, that, that, that um, is it an easy, is, is the United States uh, an, an easier place to get grant funding, do you think? I think, um, I mean, I have never worked within uh, one of these news organizations and I know there's a lot of, uh, struggle and challenges here, but it does seem like the available the, there are more available philanthropic funds um, in the U.S. than in the U.K. However, we see the largest success among, to your point, those larger organizations building relationships with the larger philanthropic sites, and a lot of our our local members, like yourself, that are, are just one person or just a few people, are are having extremely similar um, challenges and. Uh, I might add a lot of the more, you know, places focused on covering uh, communities of color also tell us that they struggle finding grant funding. And so I think, um, so I think you're exactly right. I think, I think there's more, there's, you know, we can see in our data, there, there is a, a larger pool of philanthropic funding in the US, but where it's going isn't so much perfectly distributed. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, it, it has made me think there's a sort of interesting strategic question here for a PINF or an organization that can can raise some money of like trying to build out that mid middle tier because we've got a few a few little independents who are actually yet yeah, could potentially be turning over more than a million a year. And then we've got this this big bubble of, of, of indies that are one or two people and then where's this sort of middle stripe and if we could, if we could build that out. I don't know is this the sector be a bit more balanced I'm not sure. Mm. Um, um, I, was, I, was, I was curious to hear from Ron um, in over in Indiana. I don't know. I don't know what size of organization the Limestone Post is. So are you sort of sort of micro micro, or, or are you in that sort of mid tier somewhere, Ron? Uh, we are on the lower end. We're more like Daryl's organization. I mean, I'm I'm the only full time employee, but we have we have a team of contributors, freelance contributors, photographers, whatever that we can call on. Um, so we might be a little unique in that we started as a for-profit in 2015. And so our main revenue was from advertising. So we built relationships here in town and we cover a small area like one county and surrounding counties, South Central Indiana. Um, and so we, we were doing okay with advertising, uh, but I just kind of saw which way the wind was blowing and keeping it my you know, eyes on the industry and saw this movement toward nonprofit journalism and thought we can survive as a for-profit, but to really do what we want to do to grow and to have a bigger impact, becoming a nonprofit was the way to go. So in 2019, we did that. And in 2020, I uh, took that time off to uh, during the first year of COVID to figure things out like how to get grants, uh, how to build a nonprofit organization, and things like that. 
Um, it was like a master's class in nonprofit administration. Um, so, so now we can still build off that advertising revenue. Um, it's, uh, the local businesses are very supportive of local ventures like ours, and they're we're a university town, so it's it's an engaged community. They're aware of what's going on. It's fairly well educated. Um, but like everywhere else, we have our problems with the opioid epidemic housing and things like that. So there's a lot we want to cover. Um, and so getting the revenue in to, to do that properly is, is our uh, goal right now. And uh, we've, we've received a few small grants, but now we're going for the bigger fish. There's a community foundation, a very strong community foundation here in town that um, we're, I just got on an email a little bit ago, I can't wait to read the rest of it, but we've been invited to uh, submit a full proposal. We submitted a letter of intent and we've been accepted so we can uh, submit a full proposal. And we're doing this in collaboration with the local community radio station. They're a nonprofit, almost all volunteer driven community radio station. They're, they're a local um, institution. They've been around for 25, 30 years. So everyone knows them. Um, a lot of people know us, but combined, we can, we can uh, present this project to cover various topics. Um, I, I think we mentioned housing. Um, I'll just say housing, do a series of stories on housing. And then on the radio, we will interview the sources and spread our impact around. That's that's a big issue with us and with funders is what's your impact going to be? Well, it, it's hard to say. I mean, what do we say? Our Google Analytics will will prove that. I mean, how how important is that? I think it's important because we're going to say that. But uh, we we, uh, you know, like Joe was saying, we want to uh, show in more than just qualitative ways about impact. So that's what we'll be looking at. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the reasons I wanted to hear what y'all had to say today um, among the many other interesting things. But I don't know if that answers the question. Thanks, yeah, it's interesting and good luck. I think okay. the, the community <laughs> foundation world is, is much more developed in the US. We don't yeah. quite get the same kind of local level philanthropy in the UK, this, this big national, charities and the lottery we have a national lottery funder very big across across the board but we don't have those same kind of really localized funders which i think is quite interesting and i know there are, there's a few people trying that in the uk there is we came across a recent sort of community foundation down in the southwest and we're going to be tapping those people up and seeing if we can convince them to to, to move into the media mm. space but, but we'll mm. see um I can't remember if we set a time limit for this meeting. We probably did. Uh, we probably said it was sort of uh, four till five or 11 till noon uh, or Indiana. I don't know what time zone Indiana's on. Is, um, but happy to, to sort of wrap up here or I'm happy to stick around a bit longer. Um, we should share emails. Yeah, Emily's done that. Very good. Yeah, thank you so much for joining everyone. And I hope uh, this was the first time Joe and I had have publicly uh, created a Zoom to share findings. So we hope you message us and tell us a bit more about what you're either looking for if you're representing a publisher, you know, the types of data or information that would be useful for you to make these pitches or craft your strategic planning. And then if you're a fellow tracker of public interest journalism, please do get in touch and um, join Malta, Joe and I in creating this coalition of folks tracking public interest journalism. Thank you again for joining. And enjoy the rest of your holiday, Daryl. <laughs> yeah, have fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Thanks, everyone, Thank for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you.